Thank you very much. Is my voice carrying through the system? Wonderful. No? Not, not, well, not well enough? Th then I need some assistance here. How is it now? Better? Okay. So if at any stage the voice drops, please shout or raise your hand and we'll try and do something about it. Uh, thank you, uh, Art. And thank you, D uh, David. And thanks, everybody. Thank you, the youngsters from India, for that wonderful presentation. Thanks a lot. And thank you to the Three College Dubuque Choir. Wonderful. <laughs> After 12 plus years at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, it was about time that I should visit Dubuque. <laughs> My very first visit to this place, which is supposed to be sort of somewhat more or less like heaven, And my conversations with about 25 plus people living in Dubuque encouraged me a great deal because I found a spirit of, for understanding the world, for changing the world, for bringing justice in the world, for reaching out to the world. So I salute you, Dubuque. Uh, now, Art mentioned this message that I heard for the first time from his uh, daughter and grandchild and about the similarity between M.K. Gandhi and Art Roche, <laughs> to which I testify. You know, Art uh, traveled on Thursday drove all the way from here to about, you know, I am a professor at the University of Illinois, but I'm not really qualified to live in the United States because I don't drive. <laughs> so Art drove yesterday to Urbana-Champaign. Today from Urbana-Champaign to here. Tomorrow after I give a talk at Divine Word, he takes me again from here to Urbana-Champaign. And on Sunday he drives back all the way from there to here. So what a hero he is. <laughs> uh, and he represents all of you and the, and the great team working for peace, for, for me to take part in this uh, peace festival or this peace season in Dubuque is a very great honor. Um, now, I'm not a trainer of conflict resolution. I'm a historian or a storyteller. Yes, in my longish life, I have for many years uh, worked uh, to resolve conflicts. I've worked with absolutely wonderful people, courageous people, courageous in their ability to forgive very profound wounds. And I've had the sorrow of seeing some of these wonderful people I've worked with in the northeast of India, in Kashmir, in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan, killed. Some of these wonderful people I've worked with are no longer with us because they were willing to sacrifice their life for peace and for justice and for reconciliation. Now, although I have worked for many years in conflict resolution directly working with people involved in conflict, in more recent years, as I've indicated, I've been more a historian and a storyteller. So this evening, I'm going to speak to you about some amazing people I have met. And these are people whose names you know. These are people about whom you know. But I've had the good fortune of actually meeting them. The Dalai Lama, Nelson Mandela, Aung San Suu Kyi, Martin Luther King Jr. All these people I've had the privilege of meeting and my grandfather Gandhi, and a man that some of you have not heard of, maybe many of you have not heard of, but all of you should know about, a man called Abdul Ghaffar Khan, sometimes also known as Bad Shah Khan, a Pashtun, a great comrade, fellow fighter, 
brother in spirit of Gandhi, born in 1890, died in 1988 at the age of 98, who lived in this Pashtun country, which is every day in the news, and the world does not know about the heroic, nonviolent, reconciling work of Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan. And I hope to convey to you something about him uh, this evening. Now, the Dalai Lama, I've met about a dozen times. He's exactly my age, or I'm exactly his age. <laughs> I've known him from the year 1959 when he left Tibet and came. He was forced to leave Tibet and he came to India where he found exile. Now, isn't it amazing that this man without a country is loved in every country? This man everyone would like to have in their own home, but who longs to go to his home in his own land and he can't go there. One who has not yet won his battle for his people, but who has made Tibet a household name among all peoples. The Tibet the Dalai Lama has brought to life to hundreds of millions of people worldwide is not lost in images of fire or smoke or blood, which might have been the case had he pioneered a violent revolution. But it's a land that stands for compassion, for mutual respect, for the primacy of the moral and the spiritual over the material and the violent. I will fight for Tibetan rights, he says, but I'm not willing to kill the Chinese or to hate the Chinese. I love the Chinese, he says. What a presence the Dalai Lama is in the world. And shall we have the wisdom to learn from him? I found that he's a great and empathetic listener and he's able to laugh at himself. Then there's Nelson Mandela. We know that he was once a militant leader. He wielded the gun. But then what a battle for reconciliation after struggle he has successfully waged. He is the protector of the whites of South Africa. He is the friend of those who jailed him. He is the friend of the jailers who were enforcing the imprisonment on him the friend of his oppressors. Now, one of the very first visits he made after his release, this is much before he became the president of South Africa, was to India. And he made that visit when I was a member of the Indian parliament of the Indian upper house, the Rajya Sabha. And for four days, I traveled with him to different parts of India in a small government of India plane. Uh, we went from New Delhi to Agra, the place where the Taj Mahal is. We went to Banaras, the holy city of the Hindus. We went to Calcutta, the great city in the eastern part of India, which for many decades, a long time ago, was the great capital of the British Empire for the whole of the East. It was the capital of India. It was the capital of the British Empire for much of Asia. And there's a huge house, which was the house of the British Viceroy, is now the house of the Indian governor of the state of West Bengal. And that's where Mandela stayed. That's where I stayed during that visit. What did I find about Nelson Mandela? Everybody wanted his autographs. Sometimes people were so keen, so keen to get autographs, not only for themselves, but for all the relatives and their friends, that they thrust a sheaf of scraps of papers into his hands, please, would you mind? And this man did not mind. He wrote on one piece of paper after another, not just scrawling his name like that, with best wishes, Nelson R. Mandela, again and again and again and again. And then at this house in Calcutta, this Raj Bhavan, as it's called, after his two nights there, time to say goodbye to his host, the governor, which he did. And then he wanted to say goodbye to every single servant in this large mansion. And he sought the servants out in their dark corners in these passages and corridors these shy, diffident servants. 
And Mandela went all the way to seek them out, to shake their hand, and to thank them. I don't think the Rajbhavan servants have had many guests like Nelson R. Mandela. Then there is this lady who is now in the United States, just arrived two or three days back from Burma. You all know her name? Say that again. Aung San Suu Kyi. Aung San was the name of her father, who was the great liberator of Burma, who was killed, assassinated. And Suu Kyi is her, her, her name, Aung San Suu Kyi. And she met the president. She met Hillary Clinton. And she's traveling to many places. I don't know whether she's coming to Iowa or not. <laughs> if she's lucky, she would. But what a miracle has, hap has happened in Burma. Of course, the ground is still very treacherous for her. Her role is very delicate. Uh, the military is still in charge. It is giving her a good deal of freedom, but they're still in charge, and they can do what they want to her. It's a very interesting and crucial experiment in the world. And of course, apart from the authoritarian, dictatorial, often tyrannical rule of the military regime, Burma also has, like many countries have, the challenge of ethnic diversity and so many different ethnic groups living in, in Burma, and their re relationship with the Burman people of Burma is a great challenge that Suu Kyi recognizes, and she's spoken about it. But I want to read a few of her comments that she made in interviews. This was some years ago, but I think they are still of interest today. A journalist who managed to meet her when she was in house arrest asked her, on behalf of Burmese students, shouldn't the democracy movement engage in an armed struggle rather than continuing in a nonviolent way? This is what Suu Kyi replied. Even if the democracy movement were to succeed through arms, it would leave in the minds of the people the idea that whoever has greater armed might wins in the end. Nonviolence is often the slower way, and I can understand why our young people feel that nonviolence will not work especially when the authorities in Burma are prepared to talk to insurgent armed groups, but not to a nonviolent organization which carries no arms. But I will not encourage that kind of attitude, because if we do, we will be perpetuating a cycle of violence that will never come to an end. Then this interviewer asked her whether she was a good person. This is what Suchi replied, I do try to be good. Uh, that is the way my mother brought me up. I'm not saying I succeed all the time, but I try. I have a terrible temper. I will say that I don't get as angry now as I used to. Meditation has helped a lot. But when I think that somebody has been hypocritical or unjust, I have to confess I still get very angry. When I get really angry, I have to be aware that I'm angry. I watch myself being angry. And I say to myself, well, I'm angry, I'm angry. I've got to control this anger. And that brings it under control to a certain extent. What a frank and honest person. Then she was asked if the military rulers had managed to capture her emotionally or mentally. No. And I think this is because I've never learned to hate them. If I had, I re would really have been at their mercy. People ask me why I was not frightened of them. Because I was not aware that they could do whatever they wanted to me. Oh, I was fully aware of that. I think it was because I did not hate them, and you cannot really be frightened of people you do not hate. Hate and fear go hand in hand. Saying that because of the tremendous repression to which we have been subjected, her words, her struggle had to have a spiritual component, Suchi added, that her love of literature was also of assistance. My other passion is literature. It seems to dovetail with politics. So it's interesting that good, interesting, fascinating literature is something that Suu Kyi equates with the spiritual approach, with meditation, with political struggle. She was asked if her life was complete. Well, here and now, I'm not part of my family. You know that her 
husband died far away, her children were not near, near her, and the family is part of one's life. So I cannot say that my life is complete. But I don't think anybody's life is complete. There is no perfection in this world. Once you accept that fact, you can lead a full life wherever you are. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. It was my great good fortune to shake the King Jr. hand and to be photographed with him. If you don't believe that, look at the complete works of Martin Luther King and you will find this photograph. <laughs> I also had the privilege to meet his remarkable father, Daddy King. Some of you have heard of him. He was a fiery speaker. Martin Luther King Jr. often had a mild appearance, not Daddy King. Now, King died at 39. Gandhi was exactly twice that age when he died. Both were killed because of what they believed and what they said. Before he was gunned down, King was organizing the garbage workers of Memphis, Tennessee. Three days before he was gunned down in Delhi, Gandhi spoke about the quote unquote untouchables and the garbage workers of India. He had heard a report of the squalor in which these former untouchables were obliged to live in the city of Ajmer, about 300 miles to the south of Delhi, as indeed is true in, still in many parts of India. This is what Gandhi says. This is independence has been achieved. And this is just before Gandhi was killed. We have secured our independence, but it is of no value if we cannot stop such a thing. And it can be done in a day. Can we not provide a piece of dry land for these people? If they must remove garbage, must they be also made to live in it? We have become heartless. Now Martin, or Mike as many used to call him at the time, was a student, probably 19 years old, at Crozer Theological Seminary in Chester, Pennsylvania, when after Gandhi's assassination in January 48, he heard of Gandhi's nonviolent philosophy from a, prof from a professor called George Davis. Martin remembered the reference, but it was in 1950, two years later, when as a 20 year old, he went to Friendship House in Philadelphia to hear a talk by Dr. Mordecai Johnson, president of Howard University, who had visited India after Gandhi's death, that an impact was made on Martin Luther King Jr. We have King's own words, his, Dr. Johnson's message was so profound and electrifying that I left the meeting and bought a half dozen books on Gandhi's life and works. Let me see how many books you will buy after this meeting. <laughs> Thereafter, and again we have King's own words to that effect, he felt that Gandhi's was a moral and practical way for oppressed people to struggle against injustice. Moral and practical way for oppressed people to struggle against injustice. King saw Gandhi as, in his words, lifting the love ethic of Jesus above mere interaction between individuals to a powerful, effective social force on a large scale. In the spring of 59, 11 years after Gandhi's death, King visited India. He conferred with some of Gandhi's political, social, and spiritual associates, including Prime Minister Nehru, Vinoba Bhave. By this time, King had developed and employed his own strategies for nonviolence. The struggle of Rosa Parks and others in Montgomery, Alabama had occurred. And King had several times articulated his faith in nonviolence. Thus, in a letter that he wrote in 1957 to Chester Bowles, recently ambassador to India, this is what King said. The Negro, this was the word he used at the time, all over the South must come to the point that he can say to his white brother, we will match your capacity to inflict suffering with our capacity to endure suffering. We will meet your physical force with soul force. We will not hate you, but we will not obey your evil laws. We will soon wear you down by pure capacity to suffer." Unquote. If a scholar, either of Gandhi or of King, were to read these sentences minus the words, quote unquote, Negro, and the South, he would have difficulty deciding who wrote them. The agreement of the two on an understanding of nonviolence, on a language to express it, was absolutely complete. Neither Gandhi nor King ever claimed 
that nonviolence or satyagraha, clinging to the truth, was original to them. When the realization of its potential came to them, each felt like shouting Eureka. But they well knew that the discovery had also been made in earlier generations and earlier centuries. In the famous letter from Birmingham City Jail, King speaks of figures in the Old Testament, of Socrates and the early Christians as the pioneers of civil disobedience. They placed conscience above life. Arguing similarly, Gandhi said that nonviolence was as old as the hills. Now, violence and revenge are also pretty old, although sometimes their advocates give the impression that might is right is a brand new discovery. In India, nonviolence was powerfully extolled in some ancient and pre Christian Hindu texts, even more powerfully in Buddhist and Jain texts. But Indian tradition had somehow reduced nonviolence to a matter of vegetarian diet. So, as King put it, a Gandhi was needed to present and demonstrate nonviolent struggle in social relations. Now, might is right is also in some ways an old Indian doctrine. In the ancient epic Mahabharata, a gripping account of revenge and tragedy, which continues to influence modern India today, the hero Arjuna regards his bow, Gandiva, as the ultimate source of power. It was a view that the Buddha challenged a few centuries before the common era and which Gandhi defied in the 20th century. Gandhi claimed that stronger than firepower was truth power or soul force, or to use his phrase, satyagraha. Like King, Gandhi located the source of power in the individual conscience. In a very King-like sentence, Gandhi wrote, that the only tyrant before he, whom he would bend his knee was the still small voice. It is of interest that depths in Gandhi's thinking were probed by some of his African-American interlocutors. In 1936, Howard Thurman, then Dean of Rankin Chapel in Howard University, visited Gandhi in India, along with his wife, Sue Bailey Thurman, and with another couple, Edward and Finola Carroll. Thurman asked Gandhi why, in his discourse, he used the expression nonviolence instead of the expression love. A very natural question. Why nonviolence? Why not love? This is what Gandhi said. In spite of the negative particle non, nonviolence is no negative power. We are surrounded in life by strife and bloodshed, life living upon life. Nonviolence means love and yet maybe something more. Gandhi added, love in the English language has other connotations too, so I was compelled to use the negative word. If love had other connotations in 1936, we can think of other connotations today. But there was another decisive reason for Gandhi to use the phrase nonviolence. Because love might, might suggest an absence of struggle. Like King, Gandhi wanted to convey both goodwill and struggle. They were not for hitting back, but they were strongly for clinging to the truth pulsating from their souls, hence nonviolence, hence satyagraha. It was at this 1936 meeting in Bardoli in Western India, between the Thurmans and the Carols and Gandhi, that Gandhi made what proved to be a prophetic remark. This is what he said, quote, well, if it comes true, it may be through the African Americans that the unadulterated message of nonviolence will be delivered to the world, unquote, 1936. Martin, or Mike, was eight at this time. But the forces of destiny that would capture and catapult King and make him the symbol of nonviolent resistance all over the world, including in the Soviet empire, were already at work. Now, in the summer of 1945, an African-American journalist, Deaton Brooks, junior of the Chicago Defender, met Gandhi in India and asked for a message for Americans. My life is its own message, Gandhi replied. This audacious remark is well known. How many of us will say my life is my message? Most of us will say, wait a minute, my message is much greater than my life. Don't judge my message by my life. <laughs> but Gandhi had the audacity to say my life is my message. 
But we don't know, we know this remark, we don't know that a question from an African-American journalist elicited that remark. 18 months thereafter, Stuart Nelson, dean of Harvard University, visited Gandhi in Noakali, a part of Bangladesh today, where Gandhi was engaged in a mission to bring healing and courage to victims of religious violence between Hindus and Muslims. At his multi-faith prayer meeting in what was a Muslim majority area, Gandhi requested Nelson to sing a Christian song. Nelson offered, O oh God, my help in ages past. Gandhi translated the meaning of the song to a mixed audience of Muslim and Hindu women and men. What a wonderful image. A Muslim majority area. And Muslims and Hindus, men and women in the audience. And Gandhi asked Stuart Nelson, an African-American Christian from the United States, to sing a Christian song and translates it for the Muslims and the Hindus. When King asked African-Americans to fight white supremacy, racism, and an unjust social structure, and yet love the white American, and when Gandhi asked Indians thirsty for independence to give their lives for it, and yet not hate the British, the two were asking for a lot. They were expecting much, maybe too much from the ordinary individual. But they had a good practical reason for doing so. Violence was counterproductive. It gave a momentary thrill or feeling of relief, but invited from the power structure a terrible reprisal that left the oppressed much weaker than before. Gandhi and King knew this. And we have seen this in recent years again and again and again in so many parts of the world. Now, this man that you have not heard about and you should know about, Badshah Khan, or Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, 1890 to 1988. A Sunni Muslim who won more than one tussle against British power in his region. And then after Pakistan's independence, fought against difficult odds for Pashtun autonomy and dignity. The efficacy of the nonviolent movement of Badshah Khan, as Ghaffar Khan's Pashtuns like to call him, comes across from this recollection by a British officer called Bacon. He was a British officer during the 1930 struggle when thousands of Pashtuns non-violently stood up to the British at Badshah Khan's call. Eight years or so after that 1930 struggle, when Badshah Khan's followers, the Khudai Khidmat Gars, or the servants of God, also known as the Red Shirts, they had won power in provincial elections. And Badshah Khan's older brother, Dr. Khan Sahib, had become the premier of the province. Bacon, who was a British officer still at this time, talked about the 1930 events with Ghaffar Khan's son, Ghani Khan, who has described the conversation. Bacon told me, Ghani, I was the assistant commissioner in Char Sadda. The red shirts would be brought to me. I had orders to give them each two years rigorous imprisonment. I would say, are you a red shirt? They would say, yes. Do you want freedom? Yes, I want freedom. If I release you, will you do it again? Yes. Bacon said I would want to get up and hug him, but instead I would write two years, two years. So that is the power of Satyagraha, Satyagraha to win over your adversary. It was in that year, 1930, that soldiers of the British Raj Indians belonging to the Garhwal Regiment famously disobeyed orders to open fire on nonviolent rebels in Peshawar. The psychological victories that Ghaffar Khan and Gandhi won over the British were also political victories. Now, around, around the time that Bacon was talking with Ghani Khan, the latter's father, Ghaffar Khan, told Gandhi, his guest in the frontier region, as follows. We used to be so timid and indolent. The sight of a single Englishman would frighten us. Our movement has instilled fresh life into us and made us more industrious. We have shed our fear. We are no longer afraid of an Englishman or for that matter of any man. 
Englishmen are afraid of our non-violence. A non-violent Pashtun, they say, is more dangerous than a violent Pashtun. This victory over fear is what Nehru, Gandhi's political heir and India's prime minister from 47 to 64, would single out as the chief accomplishment of Gandhi, or as may legitimately be said of Gandhi's non-violent strategy. Fearlessness, yes, I would say fearlessness was his greatest gift, said Nehru. And the fact that this weak little bundle of bones was so fearless in every way, physically, mentally, it was a tremendous thing which went to the other people too and made them less afraid. Now, if nonviolence overcame fear, it was also an antidote to a bane of Pashtun society, the revenge code. As Gandhi put it in the summer of 1940, when he and Ghaffar Khan were defending a nonviolent strategy before colleagues who were tempted by the route of violence, Gandhi said, Bhatshya Khan is a Pashtun, and a Pashtun may be said to be born with a rifle or a sword in his hand. But Bhatshya Khan deliberately asked his Khudai Khidmatgars to shed all weapons. He saw that his deliberate giving up of the weapons of violence had a magical effect. It was the only remedy for the blood feuds which were handed down from sire to son, and which had become part of the normal life of a Pashtun. They had decimated numerous families and nonviolence seemed to Ghaffar Khan to have come for, to have come as longed for salvation. Now, apart from the fact that a nonviolent strategy did not invite unbearable retaliation, it won enthusiastic support from a general populace that was spared Sorry, I'll see that again. Since a nonviolent strategy did not invite unbearable retaliation, it won enthusiastic support from a populace that was spared the off brutal reprisals that violent attacks ask for. The analyst Harold Gould has contrasted the methods of Gandhi and Ghaffar Khan that brought down empires in South Asia with the walking bombs in the Middle East and Kashmir, whose self detonations invite devastating retaliatory assaults on their innocent fellow citizens. Remembering the violent upheavals that destroyed life in the frontier area during his boyhood, Ghaffar Khan spoke with justifiable pride in his autobiography of the contrasting results of the movements he led in the early 1930s. The British crushed the violent movement in no time, but the non-violent movement, in spite of intense repression, flourished if a Britisher was killed, not only was the culprit punished, but the whole village and the entire region suffered. The people held the violence and its doer responsible for the repression. In the nonviolent movement, we courted suffering, and the community did not suffer but benefited. Thus, it won the love and sympathy of the people. Now, as we have seen, adhesion to a nonviolent approach also attracted issued an ultimatum to the Viceroy, which was to be followed by an intensification of the campaign. But he stopped the campaign. Even though, as Gandhi would say, he was tempted not to be seen as a coward who withdrew after issuing, in his words, pompous threats to the government and promises to his people, unquote. When Gandhi called off the campaign, thousands of his fellow fighters were already in prison for their passive resistance. They were aghast at what they saw as a retreat and for the time being, the Indian people as a whole seemed demoralized. Later, however, critics of the suspension acknowledged, one after the other, that the movement was slipping into unreliable hands, and that by his temporary suspension, Gandhi had managed to salvage its prestige, including in faraway Britain. One result was that in 1931, when Gandhi went to London for talks with His Majesty's government, the British public welcomed him enthusiastically. Even though a year earlier he had led an India-wide movement that, in the words of Winston Churchill, quote, inflicted such humiliation and defiance has, as has not been known since the British first trod the soil of India, unquote. Now, after the revolt of 1857, which is part of the story of my book, which saw cruelty from the Indian side and horrific repri reprisals from the British, 
the sentiment in the UK was of rage against Indians. In 1931, by contrast, and despite even greater defiance in India of British rule, the mood in Britain was friendly to Indians thanks to Gandhi's nonviolent approach. He had spelt out the secret of success in remarks that he had made in 1919, the year that saw the worst incident in the annals of British rule in India, the Amritsar massacre, many of you know of it, as well as violence by Indian mobs. This is what Gandhi said then. The government went mad, but our people also went mad. I say, do not return madness with madness, but return madness with sanity, and the situation will be yours. Now, we can think of this today in Libya, in Egypt, in so many parts of the world. Do we return madness with madness or with something else? Now, Gandhi also saw, and Ghaffar Khan also saw, that if you use violence against your enemy today, the British, tomorrow you will use violence against your fellow Indians. There is absolutely no escape from it. This is what Gandhi said, the bomb now thrown at Englishmen will be aimed at Indians after the English are there no longer. And this again we have seen in country after country after country. And of course, Gandhi defined the enemy, he said, their enemy is not the English. The enemy is imperialism. The enemy is oppression. The enemy is injustice. The enemy is not the white man. Again and again and again he said this. When many Indians wanted to identify the enemy as an individual, as a race. And once when, in a famous incident, a young Indian student in England killed an English official in India who was then in London at the time. Many young Indians in England were excited, fantastic. We've killed this oppressor. And Gandhi absolutely stood against that. And one of his comments was, is it that everyone with an Indian skin is good? If that is so, there should be no protest against oppression by Indian princes, Indian landlords. India can gain nothing from the rule of murderers, no matter whether they are black or white. Under such a rule, India will be utterly ruined and laid waste. Now I want to say something about Islam, the Middle East, violence, nonviolence. There's some important angles to this. Was there no nonviolent way of objecting to insults to the Quran? If we say there was not, then we are allowing others to control us. We become predictable, controllable, we can be manipulated, we become puppets. They pull a string, we behave as they desire us to behave. To harbor foolish rage and a wish to burn or kill at the slightest provocation is to give others control over our lives. It is the exact opposite of independence, it is slavery. Slavery to anger, also slavery to our enemies. But those who made the film or the video also bear a huge responsibility. They certainly knew it would trigger rage. Perhaps they wanted the rage. I will say what I feel like saying, I will provoke, I will enrage. This may seem the voice of free speech. It is also a voice of callous indifference to loss of life, if not a direct invitation to bloodshed. And what about the violence in Syria? Over 25,000 killed in 17 months. What does it mean? Is it only opposition to a brutal dictatorship? I'm sure much of it is. But there is also militant extremism, anger, possibly Al-Qaeda extremism. There's also an anti-minority element here. Do we want a worldwide Sunni Shia divide? Or an Arab Persian divide in the Middle East? Some would say, oh yes, far better for Sunnis and Shias, Arabs and Persians to fight one another than for Muslims to fight America or Israel. But we here, I'm sure, are saddened by killings anywhere, by anyone, of anyone. Now in 2010, I was in Palestine, I saw 
so many wonderful, amazing groups of nonviolent activists in Palestine. You, many of you have heard of them. There are films about them. You can see them on, on the line. And Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs together making a video of Gandhi, Mandela, and Martin Luther King with an Israeli Jew playing Gandhi's role. I saw it. <laughs> and victories over an olive tree, the location of a wall or a road have been achieved by some of these nonviolent activists. Gandhi's picture was in place after place in Palestine. Through hunger strikes in prison and in other ways, more Palestinians and Israelis are passively resisting the occupation of lands than is widely known. What would Gandhi and Ghaffar Khan today say? I think they would say that death in a peaceful satyagraha in Israel-Palestine would be more dramatic, effective, and indeed glorious than death and murder through suicide bombing. <coughs> they would also ask for brains to be so stormed to discover occasions for passive resistance that are less or not at all likely to invite death at Israeli hands and more likely to attract global participation. They might point out that the salt tax was neither a dynamite issue nor a predictable one, and yet it was passive resistance against that tax that produ produced the remarkable results of 1930. But Gandhi and Ghaffar Khan would be unlikely to confine the onus for action to Palestinians or Israelis. A Gandhi who had said while commencing the defiance over salt, quote, I want world sympathy in this fight of right against might, unquote, would today ask all peoples and Americans above all to involve themselves over the unceasing plight of the Arabs and Jews of Palestine, Israel. During his 21 South African years, Gandhi received support from numerous Muslims and Jews. He would not have gone to South Africa had Abdullah Sheikh, a Sunni Muslim trader, from the town of Gandhi's birth, poor Banda not hired Gandhi's legal services. Two of Gandhi's closest friends and allies in South Africa were Henry Polek, who came from a rabbinical family in Britain with Polish roots, and Hermann Kallenbach, a gifted Jewish architect born and trained in Germany. As for Ghaffar Khan, who unlike Gandhi had visited Jerusalem, where his wife Nambata died in an accident and was buried, he was aware that some, though not all scholars, linked the origins of the Pashtuns to the Jews. Now the thesis of a clash of civilizations, no doubt antedated September 11 by several years. It was as if the world needed a simple good versus evil clash, something like the Cold War. Not hundreds of clashes involving every ethnic group from A to Z. Some minds wanted a simplifying black versus white analysis and hearts seemed to need a single enemy. Communism having gone, Islam seemed to fit the bill wonderfully. Then, 11 years ago on September 11, what the mind sought and the heart desired was apparently seen by the eye, was seen by all of us on TV. There, right before us, fanatical Muslims were aiming to destroy the financial and military headquarters of America. Now QED could be written in letters of fire under the theory of the clash of civilizations. What further proof was needed? All of a sudden, liberals became conservatives, leftists became rightists, journalists left one network and joined another. And racial discrimination, discrimination against the entire population of Muslims in the world became respectable, legitimate, and justifiable. It had taken humankind centuries of bitter struggle to accept that smearing a whole community as inferior or faulty or untrustworthy was a terrible sin and offense. Great and unforgettable crimes were committed before that struggle was won, but that struggle has not been finally won. Many in different parts of the world today accept that while all others are innocent unless proved guilty, a Muslim may be guilty unless he or she demonstrates innocence. It is a large ethical you turn the world has taken. Certainly terrorists using the name of Islam bear a large chunk of responsibility for the beliefs and biases that have produced anti-Muslim discrimination in many parts of the world. 
But I ask, in Rwanda in 1994, some massacres actually took place in churches. Did that make the Rwanda killings a Christian crime? When in the 1970s, Buddhist Cambodia was the venue for the killing fields, did the killing reflect an innate flaw in Buddhism? When some years ago, almost all members of the royal family of the Hindu kingdom of Nepal were shot dead, and later a large number of peasants and security men were killed in the shootings, was some Hindu teaching to blame? Indeed, were the two great wars of the 20th century in Europe a result of Christianity? That religion is an element in the complex stories of modern violence cannot be denied. But we should be careful before saying with finality that more than occupation, more than injured nationalism, more than despair, more than shattered dignity, more than shame, more than fear, it is religion and one religion in particular that fills a heart with hate and with the resolve to destroy others and oneself. Let us place the following words of Dr. King from the 1963 letter from Birmingham City Jail in the context of the so-called clash of civilizations. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects anyone directly affects all indirectly. I'm sure that all of you would want to go beyond the superficial social analyst who looks merely at effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. The African-American has many pent-up resentments and latent frustrations. He has to get them out. So let him march sometime. Let him have his prayer pilgrimages to the city hall. Understand why he must have sit-ins and freedom rides. If his repressed emotions do not come out in these nonviolent ways, they will come out in ominous expressions of violence. This is not a threat, it is a fact of history, said Martin Luther King Jr. From the perspective of Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail, we can ask ourselves, whether we are tearing the garment, humanity's garment of destiny. And we have to ask ourselves whether the timetable of the world outside is enough for peace and justice in the areas of conflict. And most important of all, whether nonviolent strategies have been given sufficient attention in the Middle East and in other places of injustice and conflict. I will now only say one thing before I conclude, because I want to have enough time for questions and answers. And this is about this country, which I love very greatly. I have an Indian passport. I've spent many years in the United States. I greatly love this amazing, amazing country. This country has faced tough times and challenges and has always emerged stronger. It has also been wonderfully blessed. The gun, the bomb, the drone may on some rare occasions be necessary, may on some rare occasions be necessary. But America surely stands for much more than that. In the eyes of tomorrow and in the eyes of your great statesmen in the past, America stands for dignity and peace between all human beings. May we, in Dubuque and elsewhere in the US, reach out and embrace the suffering spaces of our world. May we look in and acknowledge any places in our own minds that divide us from others. And may we look up and beseech the Almighty to use us for healing and peace in the world. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, uh, Professor Kani has agreed to uh, take a few questions and answers. So um, Stacia has the uh, mic on one side. I'll have it on the other. So raise your hand so everyone can hear and the, uh, the audio can pick it up. If your grandfather today could meet with Ahmadinejad or Assad or any of them, what do you think he would say to them? <laughs> I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. <laughs> I think he might turn down an invitation to meet them. I, I don't know. I if, don't if, know. If you had a chance to meet with them, what would you say? I think I would say some of the things that I've said here. I, I, I would say uh, to Ahmadine, Ahmadine, or to say Iran, if I were to meet Iranians, or, or uh, do you know America? Do you know the American people? How can you speak the way you speak about America? Your tens of thousands of Iranians who live in America often say that they feel freer in the United States than they feel in any other part of the world. And if you have serious issues with America, how about engaging Americans in serious discussion about, about them? What is all this talk about destroying people, destroying a nation? Yes, you may have disputes with Israel, but Israelis are the cousins of the Arabs. They share the Abrahamic heritage with you. God has created them. Can, can the Israelis exist without the Almighty's blessings? How about some kind of conversation with some Israelis? And so many Iranians have had so many conversations over the decades with so many Israelis. Now there is, there is scope for frank, direct conversation, I would say. A lot of your um, presentation tonight has reflected uh, the period where nation states were kind of the predominant uh, form of power. And today, uh, the UN estimates that people uh, living not in their, the country of their natal birth, but living as uh, undocumented in the United States or as essentially being exported uh, say from the Philippines to work in low paying jobs all around the world. This is very common now. In the United States, of course, deportations, the Homeland Department has you know, pledged itself officially uh, to deport 11 million people. Um, this is, this is uh, kind of what they call the, the global economy. And, and how, how do you reflect on that? I mean, what comments would you offer uh, about nonviolent resistance when uh, the state has taken it upon itself to physically disappear people uh, from their families, loved ones, and local economies? Yes, I, this does happen in many parts of the world, these forced disappearances. By the way, I'm not aware that the U.S. government, as of now, has said that we will deport 11 million people. I, I, they may have said it. You may have heard it. I have not heard it. But yes, I do know that deportations do, t do take place. Uh, so what is, the, uh, what is the solution? Part of the solution is for many people in the United States to engage with this issue. Why should those who are possible candidates for deportation be the only ones to face the issue? And there may be many sides to that issue. Uh, why shouldn't all Americans also play a part. Uh, is a country like America utterly ruled by its leaders? I don't think so. I think the American people still have a role. And if there are blatant injustices and blatant inhumanities, such as uh, what you refer to, surely the American people have a, have, a, have a responsibility, and I think a possibility, of doing something about it. Uh, so the, the likely victims of such oppression 
need all our support. That is what I would say. Um, I want to ask you, uh, I'm from Syria and I came here like six months ago. Um, I was studying medicine there and I was like, you know, the situation there and I was have to come here with my family. Um, I want to hear your point of view for happening there. I mean, most of people here like saying that uh, our president is a criminal and is killing his uh, people there, but I know that's not true and most of people, they, um, get the wrong idea maybe from the media or from something. Uh, I just want to hear your opinion about that. And do you, make, do you think that this is coming to an end or, or why is that happening? Why do people think like this? I want to hear your opinion about what's happening in Syria especially and in the Middle East in general. No, I've heard you, but I haven't yet seen you. Where are you? I want to see you. Come into the light. Well, you know, you are the reason for this conversation. If we can't think for Syria today, what is the purpose of our big talk? 25,000 or more killed in the last 15 months or so. And the world has not been able to do anything about it. What an indictment of of humanity's capacities for even just saving life. Uh, how to do it, I wish I knew. You ask me what my assessment of the internal situation in Syria is. I can't say that because I've not been there. I have read, of course, a great deal. I've also met some Syrians. I've heard absolutely conflicting accounts. Uh, I've heard that, uh, indeed, the government has been very authoritarian, very cruel at times, uh, and very indifferent to, to life and, and death. I've also heard that many in the rebel movement are also indifferent and can be cruel. And I've heard of the possibility of attacks on minorities. And my, my guess would be, but this is only a guess, it's not that I've been there, really studied the situation at great length and therefore can offer solid information. I can't. But my informed guess is that there is some truth in both perspectives. Uh, and part of the reality also is that there is this intensification of the Sunni Shia divide in the world, which to me is a tremendous tragedy. So uh, when so much violence has taken place and so many people have lost everything and lost loved ones, it's very hard to plead for understanding and patience and reconciliation, which will take time but all those who may have any influence on either side in the conflict must do what they can to contain the conflict and reduce it and create the climate for some kind of reconciliation, if not today, then in the not so distant future. Meanwhile, people like you and all the Syrians living in the United States are precious people that we have to support, befriend, above all, listen to. You're asking me to tell you something. Really, I would like you, you to tell me what is happening in Syria. And I would like you to tell me what you feel deep down in your heart. You and others like you are very precious people in the United States today. So I offer you my best wishes and prayers. I think, I think maybe we have time for one more question. Thank you, thank you very much for, um, for talking tonight. I'm way back here. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I know that all of us really appreciate your presence. Um, 
You mentioned, you, you mentioned uh, the reaction of Muslims to the recent, you know, a video that was made in, in Southern California and so forth and, and, um, and really had some insightful comments on there. And I wanted to just kind of respond to that more in dialogue. I don't really have a question. It's more just in conversation. And that is that, you know, while the media really points us to the thousands of people who are in the streets demonstrating angrily and doing destruction and so forth. I think my attention in all of this is drawn to the hundreds of thousands who refuse to participate in that. Well said, well said. Wonderful way to end this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much to uh, all of you for coming. We have one quick announcement before you go. Uh, maybe two quick announcements. Um, raise your hand if you are, support peace. And raise your hand if you support barbecue. We have an announcement related to both. Uh, and then we'll let Art have the last word. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm representing the Human Rights Commission. And I just wanted to give an announcement about the barbecue that's going on tomorrow. Um, in case you don't know, um, in coordination with the Dubuque Day of Peace Festival and Speak Your Peace. Um, tomorrow we're having a barbecue with free food, yes. <laughs> um, and it's gonna be from 2 p.m. until 6 p.m. at the Keel Center at Clark. Um, that's the rain site. So originally we had plans to do it at a, at a park, um, but it's gonna be like 59 degrees out, so, and, and possibly raining. So it will be at the Keel Center at Clark. So everyone's invited. Thank you. Thank you. And we, uh, we describe this as a festival, and this was one of the many other um, events that are occurring. You're all invited, if you haven't heard already, to hear um, more and some different comments from Raj Mahan Gandhi tomorrow afternoon at Divine Word College, beginning at 1.30 in the chapel. It'll be, I think, a very interesting and perhaps a little more intimate opportunity. And, um, also on Sunday, I want to be sure that you hear about the hike to help refugees. It's, it's a fundraiser for the United Nations Refugee Agency, and it's going to be at the Horseshoe Bluff in the Mines of Spain Park at 4 p.m. One hour, not strenuous, and quite fun. So if, the, if it's not terrible weather, please come, because we have, we've had kind of low sign up for that so far. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it, this was... A spectacular turnout, uh, as I expected it would be. Thank you so much, and good night.